Ask Mike, brought to you by the Stadium Shop on Razorback in Fayetteville. Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin. Mike, we ditched the black this week, so that's good. Yeah, we just good. can't keep doing we that. We can't keep know, wearing just, black yeah, every try time. Try to bounce back from these losses. We can't keep wearing black every time the Hogs lose. So let's get right into it because that's what a majority of our questions are about for today's show. Our first question is from Blood Red Hog, who says, tough loss. I think we can recruit our way out of the issues on defense. However, I am concerned Bryles and Pittman had all week to evaluate which QB would start and make the wrong decision. Malik has the escapability. Cade does not. Well, not just that. Uh, he was obviously a better passer, and that was what they said uh, going after the game. They said going into it, they'd evaluated them the week of the game, knowing all week that K.J. would not play, and that their evaluation was that uh, Cade Fortin was the better passer and Malik Hornsby was the better runner, so they, they were going to play them both. Well, that turned out to be completely bogus. Now, you know, you... I can't sit here and question what I didn't see. I wasn't at those practices. It could absolutely be that Hornsby is a gamer. He's one of these guys that when you turn the lights on, he goes out on the field, he plays better than he does in practice, and that Fortin's the opposite of that. All we know, any of us that watch that game that have a brain and eyeballs, yeah, yeah. was one guy was clearly a lot better than the other, and the mm -hmm. truth is they wasted too much time. Now, some of it was Hornsby got hurt and knocked out for a couple of series. But by the time he really got in the game and started being consistent, they were already down 21 points, and right. that really hurt. Uh, the only thing I would question, and I'm not questioning Sam Pittman's statement that, you know, Fortin looked better in practice, so that's why they decided to start him. But what I am curious about, what it, after they came back and scored that first touchdown with Hornsby in the game, then they come around the second quarter and they're going back down the field. He throws about a 30-yard pass over the middle, gets them into... Mississippi State territory, they get to actually get down to the 33, but then there are a couple of running plays that don't work, mm. and then all of a sudden you got a throw on third and 10, and he pulls Hornsby out of the game and puts Fortin and back in the game. Back in. So he's he's watched all of this. He's he's Kendall Bryles upstairs. No, he's downstairs. <laughs> is he? He's downstairs. He's watched all this happen, and he's watched these passes, and he he still thinks that. You know, Fortin is the better passer, so Fortin comes in and he throws an incompletion. And they end up with a field goal instead of a touchdown. So that's what I question. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think fans have a right to question, what is, uh, Bear, what is uh, Kendall Bryles looking at? The, what does he see about this guy mm -hmm. that makes him think Hornsby needs to come to the bench? When, yes, you got all kinds of stuff on social media after that. There were people that actually said Hornsby was no good. I don't know what they thought who they thought what was going to happen if he wasn't there. Because if that game, if Cade Fortin plays that whole game, Arkansas is destroyed. They're just, they were anyway, but they would have been completely destroyed. At least Hornsby came in and did some positive things, hit the longest, the most impressive pass I've seen this season, the yeah. one bomb, and had the longest run by a quarterback since Matt Jones. And the first time an Arkansas quarterback has led a game in rush, led the team in rushing in a game since Matt Jones. So Hornsby, you know, did good things. Uh, now he's back to being the number two guy, but, you know, again, that's what made me question that decision is how do you watch what he did in the first early part of the first quarter and early part of the second quarter mm. and then pull him out in a critical situation because what you say, uh, we don't think he can pass? I yeah. don't know. That was it, strange. It makes you think also what would have happened if he had actually started the game oh, too. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the fact that he got his bell rung, that, all yeah. of that stuff hurt. Yeah. because it put him in a huge hole. Yeah, it did. It definitely did. Lamont 7906 wants to know, are the coaches going with loyalty over production? Players constantly not playing well, but they refuse to give other players shots, it seems. Also, did we whiff on Hornsby's development? Seems like a gamer given the opportunity. You were just saying that. Mike. Well, I, by development, I don't think he means the way they developed him as a quarterback, but maybe the way he developed, you know, once – as approaching this game, did they whiff on watching what he was doing? Yeah, in I practice. think that's what the question is. Uh, you know, I'll go back to what, and you know, because we do this show, I'll, you're also on the air with me sometimes on the newscast, and I said during August camp, when everybody was talking about 
Hornsby as this slot receiver. And remember, people were coming up to us going, hey, hey, have you seen any cool plays? What kind of cool stuff are they going to do? Is he just going to go 80 yards on them? And I kept telling people, you need to forget that stuff. This guy is a quarterback. He's developed as a quarterback. I don't see anything. They, You know who's their slot receiver? Hazelwood. Yeah. You're going you to take Hazelwood out to put Hornsby in as a receiver? That never made any sense to me. So I remember thinking, this guy's really improved as a quarter. I, I, we got to see a lot of uh, seven on seven with receivers versus D-backs, which allows you to see quarterbacks throwing the ball. And I just, my overall impression during August camp was how much Hornsby had improved as a passer. Yeah. And then once the season starts, <clears throat> we don't see that anymore. When you go down there, they're not doing seven on seven anymore because the season has started. They, they do other things. They, they, I think they go 11 on 11 once we're gone, but we don't see any of that. So I was surprised when they announced a, a, at the, after the Alabama game that Fortin had moved ahead of him, but I, I thought, well, maybe, yeah, maybe Hornsby just went backwards. Yeah. Um, so, again, there, were, there was every sign that this guy had improved, and now what, what we know is what. They announced today that the experiment is over, He's no longer a slot receiver, and he is the backup quarterback. So, and, and I think it counts for something that the player wants to play that position, right? Where he, Gornsey, you know, said to Pittman. Yeah, I think he did want to get on the field, and supposedly he kind of got miffed when he didn't get any reps right, there. Right, right. And that may have had something to do with his attitude or something, because some people told me, well, he kind of moped around in practice, and maybe that's why they moved yeah. Fortin ahead of him or whatever. All I know is... It doesn't take a rocket science to know which one of those guys is you want in the game and which you don't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ronnie Hamilton asks, is KJ back for this week? If so, what does that mean for Hornsby? Well, it's interesting. As I said, he's now the, officially being officially listed the as back. the backup. Yep. So he's got his job back. He's not a slot receiver anymore. Uh, Hornsby, uh, KJ is back. He's been cleared to play. And I assume he go, will go back to his role as the starter. I've been told several times, I've mentioned it here, that K.J. is probably coming back for his senior year. So if he does, I think Hornsby's gone. Because Hornsby's got to know now he can play. He can play for somebody. He showed his skills. He's very talented. He's yeah. raw. He hasn't played enough. Uh, he would. If you can imagine now if you put him in a game and let him improve the way K.J. improved last year and got better as the season went. The more he plays, the better he's going to get. I think he can play for somebody. Yeah. So... Now they got an interesting issue here. What happens, for instance, now if KJ starts struggling in a game? Do they put Malik in there to see what he can do? You is there a, think is, yes. Is, it, it sounds crazy, but is there a possibility he could beat him out? I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, there's all kinds of things, but I do think they will lose him if they don't use him. I think that's a great phrase, and it rhymed, too. So I think you're exactly right on that one, Mike. We have two questions about Barry Odom's defensive game plan. Mousetown says, I don't get Barry Odom. How can he possibly hope to stop a passing offense like Mississippi State with a three-man rush? Rodgers had all day to throw. They never did get to him. And we have another one. And th this is a... Uh, I have to apologize because I've been saying Marty Bride's proxy and birds. they it's and they birds. told me it's birds and I never read it correctly. So I'm sorry, it's Marty Bird's proxy on Hogville. And he said, did they really believe that the Pirate would succumb to the same defensive scheme three years in a row? Granted, it was worth a try, but shouldn't we have had a alternate plan ready and enacted if after that it after that first drive? Okay, of all the criticisms that were leveled at this coaching staff <clears throat> on social media after the game. This is the one that I had an issue with because I, I don't feel, I don't think some of these people have any concept of what's going on back there. You've got your top three guys out for this game. Two of them are gone permanently. Your third best defensive back is out for this game. You've also got one of your grad, one of your transfers at defensive end out and you've got another one on the D line out, and you've got one of your two linebackers who's out there running around hobbled with an injured hip, the, you know, uh, bumper pool. Yeah. He's, he may be looking good, but he could be better than he is right now. He's out there playing hurt. About half your defense is hurt right now. That causes an issue. Now, 
if you remember, what did I say before the game? What did I say on Friday when we're doing the gear up show? I said, if I'm Barry Odom, I get rid of all that, all that blitzing stuff. I start dropping back people in coverage, which is the way he played Mississippi State the first two years. And I keep everything in front of me. And if they're going to beat me, they're going to beat me going five yards, six yards, five yards, four yards, rather than boom, I leave my inexperienced cornerbacks out on an island and somebody throws two or three bombs over the top of right. them. Sam Pittman called it a choice between a slow death and a quick death. Either way, you've got a problem. I actually liked this scheme, and I think it could have worked. There were, there were times when it absolutely worked. They knocked down a lot of passes, which is what you do when you drop all those people back in coverage. And what did they have? They had four possible interceptions that weren't interceptions, two of them in the end zone. Yeah. Let's say they come up with the ball every one of those times, all four of those picks. And why were they, why were they there to make the, be in a position to make the pick? Because you got extra defensive backs back yeah. there. That's his plan. What happens if those two balls into the end zone are picked? It changes the game. What if the, the other two are picked? But they weren't. So if you've got an issue here, and this is what I'm saying, everybody talks about having defensive backs do tackling drills, and they didn't do that, and Sam Pittman explained why. I'm saying if I'm a defensive backs coach and I'm going up against a team like that, I've got my guys out there. I'm throwing all kinds of weird passes. I'm making them reach up and catch the ball. I'm making them reach down here. I've got receivers out there in front yeah. of them. I'm teaching them how to go for the ball and not knock it away but pick, pick it. Yeah. One of the things that drives me the most nuts about watching football, drives me crazy all the time. I see everybody go, oh, he knocked the ball away, and everybody acts like it's great. What if you pick it off? All of a sudden, you stop the drive. And how many times do you see somebody knock the ball away and the next play they throw a touchdown pass? Yeah. So to me, this is an underdeveloped thing. With, with They always say that D-backs are D-backs for a reason and not receivers because they can't catch the ball. <laughs> well, I don't accept that. Yeah. You, can get, you can work on that. Yeah. But that's, it wasn't Barry Odom's scheme. The scheme worked. Yeah. What hurt was not taking advantage of those potential interceptions. Now, the part of it the second guy is asking about is the running part of it. Yes, they knew that he was probably going to run more. I think they felt like I talked to some, some people after the game, and they felt like that part of the issue there with the running game doing so, it was yeah. Arkansas wasn't tackling well. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just the scheme. They weren't tackling well. So, again, I don't know where Barry Odom goes from here. I don't know if he goes back to his three-man rush and, you know, uses uh, Drew Sanders more off the edge and they go back to what they were doing before or what. But that plan for, for that game could have worked under some circumstances. It just didn't. And unfortunately, we'll never see the alternative. Right. But if we could go back and play that game over again and all you people out there that didn't want him to do that <laughs> watches him try to blitz and go with all this blitz pressure and bring all these people up and leave those defensive backs back there on an island going, yeah, oh, no, there it goes. <laughs> I don't think they would like that either. No, I don't think they would either. That sounds like, I like that slow death versus a fast death. Yeah. I think I'd rather take the slow death than that one maybe. I don't know. Slobber Slob wants to know, does special teams have a bullseye on their shoes? They keep shooting themselves there and not missing. I'm not questioning Browse or Odom, but I'm starting to wonder about Fountain. Okay, there were, less, there were three kind of special teams issues in that game. The first, the kickoff. Because you start off right off the bat and you give these guys good field position, the right. 35 and then the 25. With that offense, what's 10 yards? I'm not going to criticize Scott Fountain for his choice of kickoff guy because that guy is among the leaders in not kicking the ball out of bounds. They keep a percentage of that. And he's been very good about not doing that. He just did it that time. You don't, a guy occasionally jumps up and kicks one out of bounds. What, you go get mad at the, at the special teams coordinator? That's his fault. He didn't kick it. You know, and you, you can't do them all right. So I don't consider that a valid criticism because he didn't continue to do it. It was just once. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the killer was the A.J. Green muffed return on the second half kickoff. Keep in mind, Arkansas has scored 10 an unanswered points. They've got momentum, and they're going to get the ball back. If they get the ball back and go down the field again and score, you know, it's a one-possession game. And that's what I was thinking all during halftime. Then we have this kickoff. 
and it lands, I don't know, inside the five, and Green goes over there, and it bounces through his legs, and he runs back and tries to pick it up, and it goes back into the end zone. And all he had to do was fall on it, and it go, comes out to the 25. He picked it up and tried to run it out, and could have been a safety, got it out to about the two-inch line. And then that forces a punt later on in a short field, and they come back and score, and all of a sudden your momentum is all gone. Okay. So you say, yeah, that's on Scott Fountain. He should have A.J. Green better prepared. He should know that all he's got to do is jump on that ball. Here's what Sam Pittman said. He actually worked on that in practice last week with A.J. Green. He actually worked yeah. with it. He said, hey, if this happens, if this ball gets by you or you muff it or whatever and it goes in the end zone, just down it. You know, you don't, don't run it out. Don't try to do that. And he panicked. Yeah. Players do that sometimes yeah. in a game. 53 years ago or whatever, I'm, I'm in, involved in a kickoff in a high school game, and I saw a guy do exactly the same thing, exactly. And he knew what the rule was, and after the game, everybody's mad at him. What's wrong, you moron? And he's like, I don't know. My brain went dead at that moment. Yeah. So it happens. That's not Scott Fountain's fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're into the third issue, which is the punter, right? <laughs> <laughs> because Max Fletcher, we've been talking about this all year. All he, year. His, his punts aren't very good. Nope. He's been averaging something like 38 yards a punt. Yeah. And Reed Bauer last year averaged 41, 42, something like that. So we're going, how did he beat this guy out? Yeah. Well, in this game, Fletcher had a 25-yard punt. Well, that finally did the job. When he got the 25-yard, Reed Bauer comes back in, and he <laughs> averages 46 yards on three punts. So... I don't know what was going on there. We're not there when he's when this is one of those things I could talk about with Odom where, where you look at something yeah. and how do you look at one guy and then the other? Well, I don't know. Maybe Reed Bauer had a bad preseason or whatever. We don't know. <laughs> but, we don't know. But at least he's back as the punter now, and I feel a lot better about that. So I don't think Scott Fountain, you can really rip him too bad. Yeah, for he that. made there the were, adjustments. There were three three mistakes in there. and. One yeah. of them wasn't, wasn't, two of them definitely weren't his fault. Yeah, exactly. And he made the adjustments when it was necessary. Eddie Lynn says Tennessee is the hot turnaround team right now. 5-0 and oh going into a clash of unbeaten teams with Alabama. Good for them, but they just had a starting defensive back arrested for felony aggravated assault. Nobody talks much about it, but Pittman seems to avoid stuff like this. I, I was glad to get a, a, a question or a statement like that because it is a valid point, and it, it doesn't. It's not that way by accident. I mean, this guys they're very careful in their recruiting process. They go in and they check out the personal history of these guys when they're recruiting him. You going after a five-star guy, but he's been in trouble and in and out of trouble. You know, the whole time he's in high school, they're going to back off from him. Uh, they've had a few incidents uh, since Pittman took over, but very few. Hmm. And it is, it's not going to matter to many of the fans that you run a clean program and you have guys that aren't running around going bananas and getting arrested. But I've always thought it, and it's not just Pittman. You know, I've covered this program for 46, in my 47th football season. Most coaches here have not recruited guys like that. Arkansas's had, they've had some. You can't avoid it. But for the most part, they have not had a lot of these type of incidents. Tennessee has a long history of that. I mean a long history of that. So, so much so that I was reading about this on the Internet uh, yesterday, and Tennessee's fans were on there just saying, so what? It happens all the time. Big deal. How soon is he going to get out? Of, does he have to stay in jail? Is he going to get to play? You know, that's all they're concerned about. That's crazy. I think it's a, it says something about the coaching staff as well. It that does. They, they it's, a, it's a compliment yeah. that, doesn't, that doesn't get mentioned very often. Yeah, it doesn't. So I liked including yeah, I'm, that. I'm glad, glad we included Thanks, that Eddie comment. Thanks, Eddie You did a good job. Um, CalHawk32 asks, can you do a rundown on the Jalen Catalan injury? Was this injury a repeat of last year or something different? I heard he was having complete reconstruction this time, but not last year. Do we think he is done with playing football, or does he want to give it one more go? Okay, they've got these – these student laws w with regard to students at a university right. in regard to their medical history. And then, and then that definitely applies to student athletes. So it, it's very tricky to, to get information like that. It has to be released by the athlete himself. And so I did some checking. They haven't, they're not going to give details on the surgery. No. The only thing I got was that the surgery was successful. He's in rehab. He goes back for treatment. 
and he's back around the team. I think for a while he was kind of depressed and he wasn't around the team, but he's back around the team. But there's no indication from anybody at this point what he's thinking about in the future. He's got a decision to make down the road. Some people I've talked to who claim to know him say that he was even concerned about this last year when he came back, that he does not want to walk around the rest of his life bunged up in some bad shoulder or something. So he might indeed decide when this is all, when the rehab is done, I'm not going to risk it again, or he might decide to go for it, or he might just try to declare for the draft. Nobody seems to know right now. Well, I guess well, the only one who can tell us is Jalen himself. So we'll see if he does in the future. BMG44 wants to know, was there serious interest from Barry Switzer to become the head football coach at Arkansas? No, I think he enjoyed his time uh, playing here at Arkansas, enjoyed his time on Frank Broyles' staff. Those two are still close or were close until Frank passed away. Barry always got along with Frank and they were good friends. Yeah. But when he went over to Oklahoma as an assistant coach and then when uh, he became the head coach after the head coach died there and they promoted him, once that happened, I think he was contacted one time by Frank when Lou Holtz was fired. Do you have any interest in coming back here? And Barry, you know, just honestly told him, look, I'm, I've got a better situation here. OU's uh, a more storied program. They've, they've, won, they've won longer, better than Arkansas. Arkansas's had that one period in the 70s where they were on fire, but Oklahoma does it a lot. And they've got a better recruiting base, and I'm in here and in good, and the fans like me, and I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and to this day, he's more OU than Arkansas, and that's not unusual. Look at Darrell Royal. Darrell Royal was a Sooner. He played at Oklahoma, but he became Texas head coach. And from that time on, he was a Longhorn. Now, you may think that's weird if you're a Sooner. How could you do that? But it's one's what you do as a player. The other's what you do for a job. Yeah. So. And they pay you, right? I mean, money talks. <laughs> but, I, but, but, but Barry Switzer, he's OU. He's not, he's not Arkansas. Yeah, not Arkansas. No, no. Lost in Swine says, Pittman says every coach has been able to recruit or he's gone. Certainly his actions have shown that. But yet I never hear of any recruit having been recruited by either Odom or Browse. Am I wrong about that? Are they just the closers or do they also get out on the road? Yeah, you're wrong about that. Because yeah. I went to our recruiting expert, Otis. <laughs> and got the lowdown on this. Browse has his minivan. He takes it across the road. Yes, they, they, they all go out on the road. Uh, I'm going to just give some names that I got from Otis. Malik Hornsby was, was landed by uh, Bryles. Nice. Uh, he, he, Bryles was responsible for this four-star commitment, Malachi Singleton. He's the kid out of Georgia yeah. that hurt himself, but he's going to enroll in January. Keetron Jackson was a uh, Kendall Bryles get. And then on the other side, Odom, Odom tends, from what I've been able to see, tends to go more for the Trent. You know, he lets transfer the other guys portal, recruit, right? and he's going after transfer portal guys. And he brought in uh, Nudie, McLaughlin, uh, Landon Jackson, and Jordan Dominic. Nice. And, but, he, but he also does recruit some, some high school guys. So, yes, everybody on the staff recruits, including the coordinators. And that is different from, from at least at Arkansas in the past. I can remember coaches that were their coordinators didn't do that. They didn't go out on the road. They just kind of supervised things, and it was the assistants that went out ah. and recruited. Wow, that's kind of interesting. I like that they go out on the road and yeah. do that. It shows they care. I think players it like shows that they as don't well. Get fired. <laughs> <laughs> shows they don't want to get fired. I do like Bryles' minivan, though. That is a, a pretty nice, uh, sweet ride there he's got when he goes out on the road. Pat Boat says, no coach's job should be on the line due to talent level in each group based on the star system. My opinion is the groups that stand out have three plus four star players like running back and wide receiver. Our DB room needs a four-star caliber guy or guys. What do you think? I think you're kind of underrating that secondary because of all the injuries. You're looking at it now and they're not performing. You say, well, they just got a bunch of three-stars back there. They got good players back there. They're just hurt. They're hurt. Uh, a lot. Yes, the wide re they're loaded with right wide receivers. They're loaded with running backs right now. I, I will say that I checked again on recruiting, and I've been told they are they really think they're going to do well in the portal and, and, and bring in some, some D-backs out of the high school ranks, so they think they'll be okay. But if they get some of these injured guys back, the, sec the secondary suddenly gets a lot better too. Yeah. So it's not that they haven't recruited back there. 
They just have an unbelievable number of injuries. Yeah, well, you know it's bad when they're pulling receivers yeah, to, to go back there. Sam Bakke, who, you right. know, they're pulling people like that. I don't to, know if he played any, but. I don't think he did, but, I mean, it's bad when you're pulling guys who are different positions over to that group. Exactly. That's, that's definitely depleted in that secondary. Razor Boost says one turnover in the last four games at the 10-28 mark of the fourth quarter, and that one was really a fluke tip in the Bama game. What is Odom going to do the last half of the season with schemes to right his side of the ship? I don't think the lack of turnovers has to do with the scheme. Uh, we talked about the four possible interceptions. That's not a, that, that actually is the scheme working. The problem is you don't catch the ball. You know, that's what you have to do. You have to actually intercept the pass. That's not a scheme issue. Fumbles, come on. You go back to the Alabama game. Alabama had several fumbles in that game, went right back to them. It just could have gone to Arkansas. It didn't. Fumbles are kind of random. You can cause the fumble, and that can be a part of good defense, but whether you get it back or not all depends on the bounce of a ball. Uh, I was watching the Alabama uh, A&M game, and Alabama was just, I mean, they were fumbling left and right. They were doing all kinds of mistakes. A&M had every break in the book. In that. It's just things went their way, and they still didn't win. But I don't think this, the lack of turnovers the last two or three weeks has anything to do with the scheme. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right on that too, Mike. Uh, Parallax Pig asks, when are Mississippi State fans supposed to stop ringing their cowbells? Okay, if Frank you go Bush. back to when the SEC instituted this rule, rule of no artificial noisemakers, the first big question that came up was with Mississippi State fans, wait a minute, this is one of our best traditions. How can you tell us we can't use cowbells? So the league office understood it was a tradition. They came up with a compromise, and the compromise was as long as you stop ringing those cowbells, when the other team lines up. We don't want you ringing those cowbells and making it noisy so they can't call their signals or whatever they're doing. And I, I wasn't at this game, but I've been to many other Mississippi State games, and I can tell you they're fairly disciplined overall because I think the reason they are is they know that if they continue to break that rule, they would eventually lose the right. I mean, all it's going to take is some other schools to go after a game and say, hey, wait a minute, our quarterback couldn't hear the signals. Mm -hmm. And then the SEC is going to step in and say, I'm sorry, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. So nobody from Arkansas complained. I haven't heard of any other schools complaining that have gone to Starkville. My experience is they're pretty good. It's mm. incredibly loud, and then all of a sudden it gets a lot quieter, you know, when, when you're calling signals. Uh, so that's the rule, and that's what they're supposed to do. Mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, and it could be that one is just ringing behind where they've got the mic set up too, right? Well, they, the, right? we, we, we went back like and listened really to, to some of the game video, and you can hear some of that, but yeah. it's, it's not anything that would cause a problem. No, nothing think. crazy. Razor Alex 88 asked, do you think the state fans abide by that rule concerning their cowbells once the center is on the football? Sometimes early in the game, it really sounded like when our QB dropped back, I could hear those bells clanging. Well, during the we play. went back and listened. Yeah. And yes, you can, but when you say those bells, you know what you're hearing? Ding, ding, doing, doing, ding, ding. You, it sounds like a few. Yeah. There, you know, there's a few goobers out there yeah. that apparently yeah. don't care what the rule is. If it, if it became a mass situation, then they would lose the right to do that. Yeah. I guess the SEC is willing to overlook a few people that are going, I'm stupid, I don't know what the rule yeah. is, or I don't care. I don't know. Maybe they are. We'll have to ask Again, the Again, I think it would take complaints from, from other teams to yeah. change that. Yeah. And, they're, I mean, you're never going to stop a few dumb people from doing it when, when, uh, when they're – when they need to, Tim Tino says, I try and keep things positive, but amongst poor officiating and weird play calling, it's tough this week. It really seems like SEC refs are conspiring with the SEC to keep the hogs down. What do you think about that conspiracy theory, Mike? You know, it depends on when you catch me and ask me that question because I'm probably... Depends kind of, on the day. I'm, I'm like bipolar when it comes to <laughs> referees because there's times when I absolutely will go around telling you they're all crooked, they're cheaters, and all this stuff. Yeah, we've heard that, by the way. And on the other hand, logic in my more sane moments, logic dictates that that's crazy. And I think right now what I would tell you is that you don't expect football players to be perfect. You don't expect coaches to be perfect. We all accept the idea that there are mistakes made in a game by players and coaches. Mm -hmm. Well, there are going to be mistakes made in a game by refs. And I think that's mostly what it is. 
The thing that bothers me is when they look at a replay, and this is not the refs, these are these goobers in back and wherever they are, Birmingham, and they're in there going, oh yeah, we're looking at this video and we can't tell what we're looking at. That bothers me, but that's not really the guys on the field that, that are doing that. So I'm going to say, at least today, that I believe that what's really going on there is not you know, referees that are biased, but referees that just made mistakes. Oh, okay. So you're on the good side today. I'm on the good side of the you're refs the, today. <laughs> you caught Mike on a good day, refs. So <laughs> Lanny says is our final question of the day. What is your take on A&M and Bama? I knew someone was going to ask this to you, Mike. It should have been a blowout. Way too close. What happened? You know, it's interesting. I was watching that game, and the, every time it looked like Alabama was going to start to pull away. They'd make a mistake, especially their quarterback. I mean, he, he threw a cup, he threw a yeah. pick. He had a couple of fumbles, and and, they, and those were costly because I think a And M used those to go back down and score and yeah. kept them in the game. And I'm thinking, look, even the announcer said the longer they're in this game, the greater the chance for an upset. So they're behind, but you keep thinking, hey, wait a minute here, they might do something here at the end. So they're driving with about four minutes to go, three, getting close to three minutes, and they get down, and it looks like maybe they're going to score and tie this game up. And I'm going, oh, if this game gets tied up and goes to overtime, I'm telling you a and going to win. So then what happens? They have three straight fault start it penalties. Back up, back up, back up. They're backed up so far now that Jimbo decides, okay, we're going to kick a field goal. So they kick a field goal, and I'm thinking, okay, that gets them to within four, but now if they can get the ball back, they can go down and score and win the game, and I think that's what's going to happen because I can I just see this happen. coming. You can just Alabama's just giving this game away, and you're thinking, they look like they did against Texas. You know, this looks like last year's A&M game. They're just, what's going on with these guys? So here they go. They punt or they kick off. Alabama gets the ball, and they're being very cautious. So what do they do? They go three and out. But now there's about two minutes to go, maybe 145 or whatever. Yeah. Kick it, punt it down there. So they're down around their a and A&M's down around their 30. And I'm thinking, well, here it goes. They're, all it takes is one big pass. Well, the guy throws two passes, and it's like they're going nowhere. And I'm thinking, they're going to run out. They're going to they're going to run out of downs here. They're not going to do anything. Okay, Alabama's safe. Then on third down and long. They've got a receiver across midfield, and he's double covered with two guys out in front of him, and the ball goes up, and it goes through two, four, pair, four hands, two pairs of hands, whoop, 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 right to this A&M guy, and he falls back, and he's now in, in Alabama territory, and I'm going, okay, it's back on again. They're going to win this thing, and then they keep screwing up, but then there are penalties, and now it's penalties the other way, and they're penalize him for holding, penalizing for referees are calling holding left and right, going, this is what, I'm telling you, they're giving in the game to them. So they get all the way down to around the three or four yard line, and it looks like this is the play of the game. And they throw it into the end zone, and there's a pick. Alabama guy runs out with the ball, runs all the way to midfield. There he's celebrating, waving, and then they go, oh, wait a minute, there's a penalty. And I'm going, oh, man, I'm telling you, this, this is, is it. It was wild. So now there's four seconds left, enough time for one play. They're on the one-and-a-half-yard line, right? And you're saying to yourself, it's over. A&M's going to win this game. The, the Aggies are going, I don't like this. You know, I don't want you're, you're to ever, going, no. ever win any game. And then all of a sudden, it's what I call an Aggie joke. Hey, did you hear the one where the Aggies thought they were going to beat the number one team in the country, and then they did this? Because that last play was <laughs> you like. You could be a young leader, Mike, with that, that joke. <laughs> that last play was like. <laughs> what are you doing? It's, it's Aggie. They Aggied it. So now Jimbo's getting all this criticism. Yeah, a lot. And some of it, to be honest with you, is a little unfair. Because now what happened was the Alabama cornerback that was covering the receiver that they threw the ball at, he said he could hear Jimbo over there yelling the guy's name. He said, and so everybody's saying, what an idiot. Like he's saying, go get it to him, get it to him. Wow. Now, Nick Saban went on his show yesterday and diagrammed and showed this thing, and it was a thing of beauty. I have to tell you, if you appreciate defense, he went point by point and showed every guy and what their responsibility was, the guys that were responsible for run stop, the guys that were responsible for covering all these receivers, and when the, when, when the ball is snapped, what you see is one guy off to the left that kind of looked like he had a step or two, 
And if that quarterback had a, had a targeted him, I think they would have won the game if the guy could have caught it. He'd have to catch it. But he, he had a step or two. Everybody else was covered, and you couldn't have run it across. They just they were there. But what happened on the play? The quarterback turns, and I know that he, the, the receiver on the right was targeted because there was no, no looking at anybody else. Yeah. He took the snap, took one step this way, and just lofted it. But what did he do? He threw the ball out of bounds at the one-yard line. You can't win if you don't throw it into the end zone. Why did he throw it this way? What was going How could you be that off target? That was the Aggie joke part. So I don't blame that on Jimbo. He didn't say, hey, get it to Dave, but don't throw it over the end zone so no, we'll just lose. just throw it in the one-yard line. And we'll, we'll be almost there. So I'm thinking, okay, this is the typical Aggie joke ending, and I'm happy about that. Then I get up the next morning, and I, I look at my phone, <laughs> and now I don't, know, these, I don't know who did this, but somebody has gone back and looked at the game video, and they've, they've noticed that when that flag was thrown on that holding penalty, the, 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 the one that put, gave them a nut, one more play, yeah. there was six seconds, not four seconds. So they're saying, we actually should have had six seconds, and if we'd had six seconds, there would have been one second left after, so we would have another chance to win. Oh, no. And so now it gets even more aggy, oh. because here's what's going to happen. I'm Don't telling tell you, this, I, will, I will predict this. From now... All the way into next season, here's what you're going to hear. Well, we really beat them. We just, the ref messed it. We had one more play and we would have won. Mm -hmm. So, combined with our number one recruiting class last year, oh, yes. we're going to be a lot better. We're going to beat them at our place. We're going to win the West. We're going to win the national championship. Great. And Great. I bring this up only to point out the difference between Aggie fans and, and, and Arkansas fans because hey, Arkansas has through, been through all that. The drop fly ball at the College World Series that you could have won the, won the national championship. And the, the 69 game where if you kick the field goal instead of throw the, try to throw a pass that gets intercepted, there's a long history of these things where you're right there about to do it and the door just gets slammed in your face. Here's how Arkansas fans react to that. Hey, it always happens. We just, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just like that. We're jinxed. That's Arkansas fans. I kind of like that. Me too. The Aggies, I like it. it happens to A&M and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, look on this. There were six seconds left. We should have had another one. We, won we really won this game, and next year we are going to win it. Now, you could say they're more positive, and Arkansas fans are more negative. I say they're I think it's delusional. More realistic. They're yeah, delusional. I was going to say Arkansas fans are realistic. So the guy that doesn't like me, the Aggie who sends in emails to oh, me yes. about the show, yeah. he's going to be waiting next year to see if they do and if they actually beat Alabama next year and win the West and win the national championship. He can send me an email, and I will read it on the he air. He said he's going to send you an email every year, Mike. Well, I'll I mean. read it on the air if they do that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Okay. But right now, I consider that delusional behavior. You, yeah. walk, you get the door slammed in your face, and your only reaction is, hey, wait a minute, but what, this happened, and we really should have won, and we are going to win next year, as opposed to the Arkansas reaction was, here we go again. Here, here it is. This is what's happening. It wouldn't be an Ask Mike without us ending on a note about the Aggies. I'm glad you included that question in there, Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.